right, so my name is Jana Beck. I respond to Yana, so if you get confused and call me Yana, that's totally fine. Um, I, I live in California. I grew up in Minnesota in the Midwest of the US, and then I lived for 10 years on the East Coast in New York City and Philadelphia, so I'm kind of all over the place, and my family is too, actually. So if you're curious about that kind of stuff, feel free to chat with me later. Um, the slide deck is online if you want to follow along, uh, but it's a pretty small room in here, so you shouldn't have trouble seeing the code. Um, I'm Jay Beck on GitHub, and the code for the project I'm going to tell you about is there. Uh, so you can find it there. And I'm also Jay Beck on a bunch of different Slacks. Um, and I'm iPancreas on Twitter. And I'm a data visualization engineer is my main job. But I'm not actually going to talk about data viz tonight. But feel free to chat to me about it if you want. Um, I work at a company called Stitch Fix, which would take a while for me to explain to you what you, we do. And it's also a US only company right now. So I'll just skip it. But I work in the data science group as a data viz engineer supporting data scientists with all their data viz needs. So if you're interested in like what that might look like, there is a link here. And you could check it out later on the, the link to the slides. Um, explains what we do in the data science division. Um, this talk, though, is about a personal project. It's not about data viz. And so I'm going to start with this little story. Um, and it starts with this, which is a treadmill. I'm sure a lot of you know, like, knew that that's what that is. Um, Right? It's a treadmill. I'm guessing a lot of you don't know the, for what purpose treadmills were first invented. And so this is the story we're going to use to set the context for this talk, which also it's cool that there's an accessibility talk later, because I'll give you the hint that this is sort of accessibility related, but not directly an accessibility project. So this is one of the first treadmills. This etching was published in a London newspaper in 1817. And uh, it's at Brixton Prison in near London. Uh, and it was invented by this guy. His name is William Cubitt. And basically, he was inspired by the sight of idle prisoners to create treadmills as a way of I inspiring in them the habits of industry, so to speak. Uh, and this was something that was actually pretty popular in the Victorian day, uh, this idea of atonement through hard work. And the fact that at first they didn't even have these treadmills hooked up to anything. So they were literally grinding air. Uh, they weren't milling anything with the treadmills. And that was seen as a m more pure form of punishment. So kind of strange. Um, so this is what they looked like again. You know, they were, they were not what today's treadmills look like. They were wide. They were kind of more like a what we call in the US a stairmaster, because you were kind of going up rather than just forward. And they were big enough for all these prisoners to stand next to each other while they were doing this. Although sometimes they had these barriers between so that each prisoner was isolated from the other one. And this was super hard work. They were usually on these. If you were sentenced to hard labor on a treadmill, you were on one for about six hours a day, which was the <coughs> equivalent of three to 4,000 meters of elevation. And oh, this version of the slide deck Sorry, it has everything in feet. Um, this is co for context. Uh, uh, this is actually a, m a mountain called Ben Lomond, which is named after a mountain in Scotland. But this is in northern Utah, where my dad lives. And it's pictured from his house. And we've climbed up there a few times. And it's about, I think this is about the equivalent of 1,200 meters of elevation from his house to the top there. So that's. Um, less than what somebody would be doing on a treadmill, doing it for six hours a day in one of these Victorian prisons, just for a little bit of context to imagine what that was like. So again, this is what we have today as a treadmill. Uh, it's something that people voluntarily use in their free time now. Uh, uh, pay, maybe even pay money to go use one at the gym, right? And then to represent the final step in the evolution of the treadmill, we have this, right? So treadmills have come a long way. So file this story away a little bit. Um, the moral of it, basically, is that the inventor is dead, literally, in this case. Um, and that technologies that we have all around us have these histories and contexts. Sometimes we don't know about them. But those histories and contexts aren't definitive. Um, so again, file that story away. Now we're going to move on. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project that I'm like, here to talk to you about today. And that project starts with this guy. Uh, his name was Jean-Dominique Bobby. He was the editor-in-chief of Elle magazine. He's French. 
and on December 8, 1995, he suffered a massive brain hemorrhage. So he fell into a coma. He woke up about a month later in January of 96, and he was completely paralyzed. He was able to move his, like wiggle his head a little bit, and he could blink one eyelid uh, because his other eye had to be sewn shut because it wouldn't close properly. And yet uh, he dictated memoirs just by blinking his left eyelid. He described in these memoirs what his situation was like. He said, you survive, but you survive with what is so aptly known in, as locked-in syndrome. Paralyzed from head to toe, the patient, his mind intact, is imprisoned inside his own body, unable to speak or move. In my case, blinking my left eyelid is my only means of communication. And so by blinking his left eye many, many times, he dictated these memoirs. They were published as The Diving Bell and the Butterfly. And then he died of pneumonia, um, unfortunately, two days after the memoirs were published in March of 1997. So the method by which he was able to dictate his memoirs just by blinking is called partner-assisted scanning. And he described this in his memoirs as well. He said, it's a simple enough system. You read off the alphabet ESA version, not ABC, until with a blink of my eye, I stop you at the letter to be noted. The maneuver is repeated for the letters that follow so that fairly soon you have a whole word and then fragments of more or less intelligible sentences. That, at least, is the theory. The jumbled appearance of my chorus line stems not from chance, but from cunning calculation. More than an alphabet, it is a hit parade in which each letter is placed according to the frequency of its use in the French language. So this is what the frequency ordered alphabet is that he used, or what it looks like for French. And he described a lot of how, uh, what it was like communicating with different people in this method. He worked primarily with a speech therapist and then with um, uh, the woman who is pictured back here, who he dictated his memoirs to. Uh, but he communicated with a lot of folks this way, anyone who would visit him. And he said, nervous visitors come most quickly to grief. They reel off the alphabet tonelessly at top speed, jotting down letters almost at random. And then seeing the meaningless result, they exclaim, I'm an idiot. But in the final analysis, their anxiety gives me a chance to rest. For they take charge of the whole conversation, providing both questions and answers. And I'm spared the task of holding up my end. Reticent people are much more difficult. If I ask them, how are you, they answer, fine, immediately putting the ball back in my court. With some, the alphabet becomes an artillery barrage, and I need to have two or three questions ready in advance in order not to be swamped. <coughs> Sorry there. Ooh. All right, Ugh. yeah, <laughs> I have a little bit of a cold, so I just got one, <coughs> one of those bad dry spots. All right, uh. like a beer, <laughs> yeah, beer is better. <coughs> All right, I'm going to skip some of the long quotations that are still there because <coughs> those are killing my voice, clearly. Um, yeah, so he published these memoirs that he dictated by blinking his eyelid. And the project that I'm here to talk to, well, so The Diving Bell and the Butterfly, right? It's a metaphorical title, and the butterfly is sort of the positive side of his condition. You know, he describes in his memoirs an extraordinary life of the mind. and. The diving bell is the other side of that. A diving bell was really old. This is, you know, like some ancient art depicting one. It was, it was a, a pre-scuba diving technology that was a big bell-shaped enclosure that trapped air and the diver inside. So you can imagine it's very claustrophobic seeming, and that's what he compared his condition to on the sort of negative side of it. And, uh, so I, I came across this story through the, there was a 2007 film adaptation of his memoirs. And 
when I came across that, it was like a late night Netflix browsing as you do, you know, I had no idea what this movie was about, but I ended up watching it and it just stuck with me. So the project that I'm here to talk to you about, if I can continue to talk, is um, a little app that I made that's a prototype of dictation just by using blinking to select letters. So I've called this partnerless partner assisted scanning because I've basically replaced the partner in the partner assisted scanning with the web application. And uh, I've done it not to be completely uh, faithful to how, what his experience was, which was blinking with one, one eye, because not all of us are super gifted in the blinking department or the winking department. So I just kind of did blinking with two eyes. Now what makes this possible is a library called webgazer.js. Uh, this is an open source library. In fact, it's uh, a copy left licensed library. It's, it's uh, uh, licensed under the GPL. And it comes out of Brown University's Human C Computer Interaction Lab uh, in the US. And there are computer scientists there that still maintain it. And they also collaborate with a few uh, uh, contributors from the Georgia Institute of Technology. So uh, just to show you a little bit of like how this library works, it's <coughs> limited right now to being in included by a script tag. There's a long running pull request that's been open to uh, mo uh, modernize it into common JS modules, but it hasn't been finished yet. So right now you just have to include it with a script tag. Um, and so this is a little just snippet of how you get started with it. Uh, you use the set gaze listener method to give it a callback to call. And every time that callback function is fired, you'll get a, a data object, which includes the X and Y coordinates of predicted gaze location on the screen uh, relative to the viewport, and then uh, a timestamp as well. And then you just f call this begin method, and that's it. It's really simple to get started with. So integrating it with React is a little weird since you have to load it with a script tag, and many of us are much more used to using um, Webpack or similar things. But uh, basically, you can just you know, load it in a script tag. Uh, it took me a while to find that you need to do it in the body versus the head for the main library, and that has something to do with how they're taking advantage of WebGL, and you need the whole page loaded before you execute the script. And I'm also loading one piece of it in the head, which is uh, they allow you the option to load. There are several different regression modules for doing the analysis of the webcam images that provides the, the eye tracking. And um, you can put one of them in a web worker for improved performance. And it actually improves by quite a bit. So I load that in the head. And so if you haven't used web workers before, they're a wonderful little tool for putting JavaScript in basically a separate thread in the browser. Uh, and then that doesn't lock up the UI. And since there's a lot of analysis happening on the webcam images in this case, that's really advantageous. So that's kind of the nuts and bolts of how to integrate it with React, like how to load it in a React app. Um, but to get into the, the details in a, in a code sense, how do you integrate it with a React component? In that case here, it's all about the life cycle. So if we look at a simple WebGazer component, uh, it have, it'll have to be a component class rather than a pure functional component because you need the life cycle methods. Um, we start with an initial state. In this example, we'll just uh, start with x and y as null. That'll be the x and y location of your predicted gaze target on the screen. And blinks of zero, obviously this prototype it needs to have blinks, so uh, we, we're not going to talk about today, although if we have a little time and you guys are interested, I can show you from another presentation about this that's less React focused, how I pulled blink data out of um, sort of the underlying data in WebGazer. It's not, blink data isn't actually surfaced in the public APIs at the moment. So for now, that's going to be all hand waving. Uh, in component did mount, that's where you do all the, the setup that I just uh, showed you setting the gaze listener instead of logging it, which was what was on the screen in the last example. Now I'm just calling set state uh, to put the uh, blinks in the X and Y. Uh, and again, this is 
uh, magic hand waving uh, because the blank data isn't publicly accessible. And then just rendering x and y and whether you've blinked at least once or not. Uh, so as I've learned giving this talk, um, this is a recorded GIF because doing live demos of eye tracking stuff doesn't work very well. It's very, very sensitive to lighting conditions. Uh, so the null part is when it was starting, obviously, when I, right when I pressed record, and then started uh, the component mounting, and, and then you can see pretty quickly that it starts giving predictions of where you're looking, and that once I blinked, the text changed. You also want to clean up after yourself if you're using this, so in component will unmount, clearing the gaze listener, and then calling an end method is what you need to do. And then there's one final piece of the API that can be fun, which is this show prediction points. So just before the call to uh, begin, or in between the setting the gaze listener and calling begin, you can pass true to this show prediction points, and, um, and then pass false when you're cleaning up. And then you get this big magenta circle. This is not what it actually looks like in the library normally, but I made it really big and bright in a custom build for this presentation so that people could see it. And you'll see that my cursor is moving here, too, when I made this recording. And that's actually because WebGazer uses cursor movements and clicks under the assumption that you're often looking where your cursor is. So it uses those to train the analysis that it's doing on the webcam images. And so for that reason, I also don't view this project as like a true accessibility project. It's more of a proof of concept or a conceptual prototype of what you can do with web technologies. Because right now, you can't build an accessible interface for really getting going with this because you have to train the analysis um, using cursor movements and clicks, which are not accessible for someone who's completely paralyzed. So that's the story there. So now let's look at like how I actually implemented this. Um, to start with, on a conceptual level, I told you that I'm basically replacing the partner in partner-assisted scanning uh, with the web interface. So let's just think about what does the partner do in that communication technique. And basically, the first part of the partner's role is to display a reference of the entire frequency-ordered alphabet, something like this. And the English version. Uh, is looks like this, and I have another slide somewhere else. It's the German version, sorry, uh, not in this deck. And then the partner's role, the second part of the partner's role is to loop through all the letters, basically by pointing to them and reading them out loud. And then the third part is to record the letters that the user selects, of course. So if you actually like literally sketch this, um, what you might have is something that, like like this, with the entire frequency ordered alphabet kind of displayed on the right side there, the current letter on the left, and also highlighted in the frequency ordered display. And then um, the selected letters in some kind of an input at the bottom. <coughs> so now let's look at this in terms of actual React. Whoops, sorry. So again, we're going to be using uh, the lifecycle, so we'll, call it, we'll have this be a class. And then the frequency ordered alphabet is really a constant in the app, so it belongs as a default prop. It's never going to change. You could get more complicated than this and probably should with something like React I18 Next to internationalize it and have different alphabets available, but always frequency ordered. And then the state is going to be a current letter and the selected letters. So. When we get to the render method, we're basically going to have three components that line up with those three boxes we saw in the UI sketch, which is a current letter display, the frequency ordered alphabet, and the selected letters. So now let's get into a little bit more code. So looping through the letters implies a start, a pause, and a reset. So we really left a few things off that sketch earlier, which is some buttons that you need. So we'll, now we'll see that we the easiest way to do that looping, of course, is to use um, an index on that array. So we'll have a current index, and I've left the current letter in here, but of course you wouldn't really need that anymore because the index is enough. You know, the current letter is really derived state from the index and the, the default prop of your alphabet. 
And then also adding a started flag here that lets us know what state the app is in in terms of the looping action. So there's adding the buttons that we need in the render method. So this is kind of what the whole app looks like. I've added one thing here, which is the letter selector. And that you could, um, uh, well, for, for that we'll need a select letter method on instance method on this class. So that would probably look something like this, um, where you're resetting the current index after the letter gets selected and pushing the letter you selected into the selected letters array. Oops. Then the letter selector component is all going to be about the lifecycle methods, just like we saw earlier with the WebGazer like simple React component. So you could actually do this in the lifecycle methods of that scanner top level component, because we haven't actually used any of those yet. But I think it makes the uh, that component a bit too complicated, and it's easier to encapsulate it. So here we'll do very similar to what we did before in component did mount set up WebGazer. And I'm hand waving a little bit more here with, um, it would be a lot of, well, it's just too much code to fit on a slide of detecting two blinks while the same letter is active is how you select a letter. So just put that in a little bit of magic for now. And then call that instance method that we pass down as a prop. In component will receive props. This is how we know um, whether or not, or how we react to whether or not the looping is actually happening with the starting and pausing of the looping through letters. So WebGazer has a pause method, so pause and resume as needed, according to that uh, top level state that gets passed down to this component as a prop, the started flag. Uh, component will unmount. Uh, again, just clean up like we've seen before. And then we render nothing in this one. This component is all about the life cycle, but so again, that's kind of weird maybe, but it keeps it enca nicely encapsulated. All the interaction with WebGazer is happening in just this little component. So here's, here's the finished product, uh, the prototype. Uh, a recording of me spelling something. Notice how the cursor doesn't move from the start button. Don't worry, this is, I spell a pretty short word, so you don't have to sit here forever and wait for it. The first selection happens here with two blanks, with an H. I don't know if that's big enough to read. And then the second one right here with an I, so just spelling high without using any hands. So now we're back to this. If I hope you've been sitting here wondering what the whole story about treadmills had to do with any of this. And what it has to do with this is that I, I embarked on this project as this exercise in empathy, you know, having watched that movie of the diving bell and the butterfly and really feeling like I wanted to understand what it would be like to communicate that way. But what I got out of the project in the end, I definitely got that out of it, this empathy exercise. But I got more out of it, which is that using WebGazer really changed the way that I think about another piece of technology, which is the webcam. Uh, I think the webcam kind of occupies a pretty low uh, public profile right now. Um, Chat roulette did a lot to destroy its reputation, right? And and then it's totally seen as a vector for spying and hacks and all sorts of things like that. Um, I love this article that I found. It just skips over the like, should you cover your webcam question and, and goes right to like, what's the best way to cover your webcam? So that is, feels representative of the kind of public opinion on webcams today. But when I was researching this, I found this. Oh, that's a little hard to see on, on this background. But this is a picture of a coffee pot. And this is one of the images from the very first webcam, arguably, which was installed on the, the pre-World Wide Web network at um, a computer lab in, at Cambridge in England. And the reason for this was that a bunch of engineers in this building, or computer scientists, had a coffee club and they had this communal coffee pot pictured here. But some of them were like several floors and staircases away from the coffee pot and they would get really annoyed if they had to like walk three flights of stairs and then find that the coffee pot was empty. So they built this camera and put, pushed the images on their local network 
to take pictures of the coffee pot every five minutes so that they could always check and see if there was any coffee. Um, so, you know, we have a contrast here between treadmills, which started as this instrument of hard labor in prisons, like instrument of punishment, and now there's something that we voluntarily use today in our free time. And webcams, which started as this amazing invention to improve like human caffeine system dynamics efficiency, and now are kind of on, you know, something that many of us actually disable voluntarily by taping over them on our computers. Uh, so this brings us back to this idea that technologies have histories and contexts, but those histories and contexts are, are not definitive, and we shouldn't let them be. I think we should broaden our horizons a little bit and how we think about the kinds of components that can go into what we build. Um, so that's it, basically. Uh, here's some references and resources. So this app, the little prototype, is at divingbell.io. I encourage you to try it out. It takes a very zen mindset to uh, spell long things. Uh, be careful that your face is well lit and it also doesn't work super great for people depending on what kind of glasses you're wearing. So be forewarned on that. Um, and yeah, a couple other links. And yeah, here's the link. And also, so if, if we have time for a little bit of q and I, I do have a few slides that I can pull up quick to show you a little bit of how I got the blink data out. So let me know if that's something you want to see. I think we have time for Q a little bit. Um, I will be personally interested. All right, so the blink detection. So this is that code snippet we saw before of how you set up the callback function. And it, obviously, all it has in this data object is the x and y. So this is where, so this only, the blink detection only came into the library about a month ago. And, um, and it's not, it's basically only being used right now. And, as far as I can tell, because this image analysis stuff is not my specialty, um, is it's being used to improve the predictions for your gaze location, because that's still what the library is mainly concerned with. And the main purpose of WebGazer is to do like user research eye tracking on web apps. Um, so yeah, they don't care so much about detecting blanks as a top level function. Um, so yeah, so this is where the hacks are ahead, because I just kind of was you know, this is just a prototype fun project. What can I do to get this working the way I want it to work? Um, so here's WebGazer source code. Oh, it's too bad that the, some of this stuff is super um, not easy to see. So there's, there's basically a detect blink function in this blink detector submodule of WebGazer. And it's a function that takes an eyes object and it returns an eyes object. And, and then on a blink, it mutates that eyes object with, by adding this blink is true property to the left and right eyes in, what are, that are inside that eyes object. So, and then to kind of step back up a little bit, the way WebGazer works, oh, sorry, this one didn't, wasn't reset. The way WebGazer works in general is that it's one big loop function that is called 60 times a second in request animation frame. And on every tick of that, um, you know, on every frame, it gets a prediction. And then it just fires that callback that you set it up with, with this gaze data. So basically, my job was to access those blinks that I know are on that eyes object that's get, getting passed around all sorts of places, and, and like hoist those up to the gaze data parameter that, that gets passed to this to your callback function. So um, I found another place in the regression module uh, that's doing the analysis on the webcam ca images where it's taking in that eyes object and I started you know, logging things to see, yes, this is happening after. It's already getting mutated by um, the detect blink function. So this is where I just sort of hacked it in where I looked for those blink true properties on the left and right eyes and just added this sort of Boolean blinked. And so then in the app, what I'm actually doing to, when I say that you're selecting a letter based on there being 
two blanks while the same letter is active, that's actually looking for two state changes from blanked as false to blanked as true, like followed by a false again, and then, you know, then another state change from true to false. Um, that's what I mean by two blanks. So it's a little odd, um, but it works for the purposes of this prototype. So it was kind of fun to dive into this code and just pull it out, <laughs> even if it's ugly. Yeah, any other questions? So it's, it's, it's time-based. So you, you look at mm -hmm. the, some time deltas and then you check if, like, if the same transition happened in, in, in between some threshold or... Yeah, I mean, what I'm actually doing in the code is looking, like, setting it, setting blank to true. So I look for that flip between false and... I don't think I'm actually doing it within any thresholds right now. Just looking for the change happening. And tracking. Will it work if I, if I will blink like very slowly, will it also work? Well, so that when, you, when I'm looping through the letters, you're only on the same letter for a certain amount of time. So that kind of takes care of the threshold thing because oh, okay. it gets reset to zero every time you move to a new letter. Gotcha. So, gotcha. yeah. So that's why I use two blinks to select a letter. Nor, yeah, it doesn't seem to be a problem um, with natural unconscious blinking. Um, because I think those are usually just one, or at least only one within the threshold of one letter being active. So I suppose it might occasionally produce a false positive. Could you track to like what letter the person is looking at and then do things that way? And that might make it quicker? Um, yeah, I get this question a lot. I really need to find a way to put this in the, to the main talk. You can't really, the, the gaze detection is not accurate enough to detect what letter they're looking at. And that's not just because the library isn't accurate enough. It's mostly because your eyes actually move all the time in a process called saccading. And that's not under conscious control. So even when you're trying to look at something very small and very specific, your eyes are kind of moving around. That's part of how we see in 3D is all these little movements that are like triangulating information. So yeah, it's just not. Uh, and if you remember back to those recorded GIFs of the, the dot bounces around a lot, and that's because of this saccading process. Can you eventually filter that out and still figure out where the person is? Or, mm. or is, that, is it so random that it's too hard? I think it's so random that it's too hard. My sister actually is a cognitive science who does eye tracking research, and I don't think that that's something that they feel as a worthwhile sort of possibility to try to do. Okay, so that limits also like user interaction in that sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Are you, planning, sorry, are you planning on uh, adding the possibility to start and end all of that recording of letters, for example, by looking a long time into one corner and then looking a long time into another one? And is it already possible to do it with this library without moving the mouse? So yeah, it's not, to answer the second question first, is it possible to do it without moving the mouse? Once you've sort of trained it, it's possible to do it, especially the blinking is, it works really quite well, I was surprised. So you can do that without, you know, with a total no hands, um, not using the mouse at all. But you can't train it without using the mouse. It, you really, it doesn't, if you don't have any training data, it won't work without. But could you just uh, have some, like, tr like a mouse, like a, a artificial mouse pointer you follow up, like training with, with some pre-recorded stuff. I, I looked into this. Yeah. You cannot, it, there are no browser APIs for programmatically moving the cursor. That's how you would have to do it okay. for the yeah. library. Yeah. I remember Googling this and all the answers were like, of course you can't do that. That would be an accessibility right. nightmare. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you cannot programmatically yeah. move the, the cursor. <laughs> yeah. So maybe if you could. What can possibly go wrong, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Send some clicks. Yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe if you could change WebGazer so that it's not using the cursor, but it's yeah. using some arbitrary element on the page, then you could do it. Yeah. But since you, right now, I, I haven't dug that deep into their code to, yeah, to even see where the cursor stuff is going on. What was the other part of your, your first question? Whoop. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I remember. OK. And then, OK, I have your question in mind. You ask yours, and then I'll answer both. OK. Uh, would it be more efficient if you recursively find out another frequency alphabet of 
all the work to start with an E, for example, and then to digitize the process even more? There are lots of ways to do partner assisted scanning more efficiently. Yeah, I was for this. I was just doing kind of a fun thing to simulate exactly how Bobi did it. Um, the most common way to do it and a better method is to have um, like rows of letters, and so you first select a row, and then you select you know, so you don't have to go through the whole thing. But yeah, there are lots of more efficient methods. And then, so your first question was about gaze tar target detection and using that to start up the app and things like that. So my first prototype before they brought um, blink detection even into the guts of the library about a month ago was based on gaze detection. And it wasn't, it was, it sort of worked, but the blink detection is way better. So, and again, that's because it's so hard to consciously focus your eyes completely on one spot. Um, I talked to my sister a bunch since she does eye tracking research and uh, she confirmed for me something that I had thought would help, which is that it really requires having like an animation to help you focus your gaze. Um, this is another, you know, sort of UI design tip. Like when you're talking about accessibility and UI design, uh, they tell you to avoid distracting animations. And that, in this case, it would be you trying to help you focus by using the animation as the target. But this is a reason why if you have some randomly animating element in the corner of your page, it's really distracting for some people with accessibility uh, issues because your gaze is just always pulled towards things that are moving. So that kind of thing would help it a lot. So if that prototype had was divided the screen in two and when you the target was the right side and as soon as we detected your gaze in that region, I would start like a little spinning animation to help you focus on that region and then it would go away when you moved your eyes away so that you weren't constantly trying to move your eyes back to it. But it's still, yeah, it wasn't Fantastic. The blink detection is way better. Um, I think it's. Uh, you cover your webcam? <laughs> I don't. I know, but I do have a privacy thing on my screen. But I, I, I always see people with covered webcams, especially at tech conferences, and er, it, sometimes it seems it's almost 50/50. And I always guess that the people that don't have it covered are the people who work remotely. I used to work remotely, so it was like, of course, I don't have it covered because I do all my work on Google Hangouts, but. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Thanks.